We begin and we see a pattern that goes across the chart. Beginning with the first group, there, are, there happens to be one valence electron. Moving to the second group, we have two valence electrons. There's a little two right here, and the two follows all the way down through all seven periods. Now we're going to skip the transition metals, that's groups 3 through 12, and then we begin again with 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 valence electrons. When it has 8, it happens to be the most stable, so that means that elements like helium, uh, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, and radon aren't going to bond with atoms of other elements because they already have 8, which means they satisfy that octet rule. But there is a common item that we find in restaurants, on your dinner table, or in your cabinets, and that happens to be salt. And salt is made up of two elements, sodium and chloride, and chlorine, which is a gas. Sodium is a metal, which is very reactive, and if you were to eat it, it would severely damage you, producing a lot of heat and a lot of internet videos showing sodium actually blowing up. And chlorine, well chlorine is a gas that if it goes into your body, it's going to produce an acid in your um, water and your, the pathways, your air, your air pathways, and that would be very bad for you as well, it's extremely poisonous. But combined together, they form a stable compound called salt. And here's why they bond so easily together. Because sodium, which happens to be right here, I'll put a note here, whoa, and we'll add our pencil, where's our pencil? There it is. Sodium, that's a symbol for sodium, has one valence, valence electron. And if we go over to here, we have chlorine. And here's a symbol for chlorine. Chlorine has seven valence electrons. And if you add one and seven, you get eight, which means that as a compound, it's quite stable. So that's how that ends up working. Now, the, remember the point of this lesson was to show you how to draw atoms of different elements. So let's go on to our next slide. And we have an example here of a, an element tile showing carbon. So we should go ahead and draw this together so we see what to do. So the first thing I'm looking at is our atomic number, which, ha which is right here. And the atomic number of carbon happens to be 6. Well, what does that mean to us? Well, it means to us that carbon, and we'll put a little P representing electrons, E representing electric or negatively charged, let's use a positively charged protons, negatively charged electrons, and no charged neutrons. If it says six for the atomic number, that means that we have six protons. And the proton and electron number are always going to be the same, so we know that we have six electrons. Then to figure out our neutrons, which are neutrally charged particles, we have to go ahead and subtract the, atom the atomic number from the atomic mass number. So that's going to be um, 12 minus six, and that also just happens to be six neutrons. Now one of the mistakes that people make if they're in a hurry is they think, well, if it has six protons, six, neutron, or six electrons, it probably has the same number of neutrons, and that is not the case as you're going to see in the next, ex next example that we do. But let's go ahead and draw this particular atom of this element. But first, we have our nucleus to draw. And so, just for the sake of it, I'm going to make a circle representing our nucleus. And I want you to imagine our nucleus being something more like a big glob of sticky gumballs all stuck together that your little brother and sister had spat out across the table and brought into a shape and it dried overnight and there you have your glob of gummy, <laughs> of totally gummy gumballs, sticky gummy gumballs, and they're all stuck together and that's going to represent your nucleus. So let's go ahead and we're going to put six protons inside, that's six? Yeah, that's, all, that's six. Six protons inside of your nucleus, and then we get six neutrons. Now we have six P's and six N's. That's our nucleus. And then we have to think, okay, well, if we have six electrons, how many go in that first cloud? Well, the rule states you can have no more than two in the first cloud. So let's put two electrons. Remember this. This is important. In textbooks, they often show electrons in perfect geometric shapes where the electrons are located exactly in the right spot. And if you go on Google, you'll see at, um, models of different atoms or different elements, and they put these electrons in these precise looking positions. But that's not really how it is. Those electrons are all over the place like a cloud. And it's pretty amazing. So the first two electrons are taken care of. Well, let me see. That, really, that leaves us with four more electrons. So let's go ahead and draw that one in. That's your second cloud. And so we'll add four more electrons for a grand total of six. So we have just drawn carbon. Now let's go ahead and move our way on. 
to the next one, which happens to be boron. You notice over here that boron is in group 13. It's also in the second period, so we know that it's going to have two clouds. And so let's go ahead and do this one. I'll write over here, I'll write P for protons, E for electrons, and N for neutrons, and then negatively charged and positively charged. Positive, there we go. And that's a, an equal sign, trying to be. And then we'll move on to take a look at our atomic number. Our atomic number happens to be five, and that tells us what? Our protons and our electrons, because those two numbers are going to be the same. So we have five protons and five electrons. And now to figure out our number of neutrons, well, we're gonna round this number up from 10.81 for the atomic mass number, we'll round that up to 11. And then we'll do a subtraction problem, just like we did before, we subtract the atomic number from the atomic mass number, and we end up getting six. See, the number is not the same. It's a different number. So here we go. Instead of making a bunch of P's and, uh, P's and N's to make up our nucleus, this time I'll just draw a circle representing our nucleus again. And remember the analogy I made to the gumballs. Now we're going to go ahead and put P equals five for five protons, and N is going to equal six for six neutrons, and now we need to draw our electron clouds. And then in our innermost cloud, again, we can have no more than two. So two of the five electrons occupies the first cloud, and the remaining three become the valence electrons. For a grand total of five, and I should probably put little negative signs there because they are negatively charged. There we go. And that's how that works on that one. So now we come back to a familiar looking model. And we have to think about this for a moment. We have to think, well, if it has two clouds, and there are two electrons in the first cloud, and there are five electrons in the second cloud, what element might this be? So let's go back to the periodic table. You might already have one in front of you. If you don't, let's go along and do this together. Two clouds, so what period is it going to be in? That's right. You're going to find yourself in the second period. And it says we have two in the first cloud and five in the second cloud. Well, what, let's find out which element has five valence electrons. Remember the pattern that I showed you earlier. So we're second cloud, one valence electron, two valence electrons. Skip over the transition metals. Three valence electrons, four valence electrons, and right here, five valence electrons, and that was with the element nitrogen. And so now, the next time that you see a model of an atom, you'll be able to know what period to find it in, and if they give you the number of valence electrons by this, you'll know by following the pattern, with the exception of the transition metals, how to find out which atom of which element it happens to be. Again, my name is Chuck Seligman at Parsons Junior High School. If you have any questions, feel free to leave me a comment and I'll try to get back to you.